Hello, and welcome to our second lecture of Principles of Oceanography. Today we'll be discussing Earth structure and plate tectonics. So an observation that is easily made in looking at a map of our planet is that the continents look like they could almost fit together like pieces of a puzzle. So North America and Africa could fit nice together with Europe fitting in the corner there. South America fitting nicely with Africa. This fit isn't exact if you look at the coastlines which are the border between the beige and the blue in this figure. But if you look at the actual edges of the continent which are indicated by the black lines in this figure you can see that the fit is actually quite remarkable. The, the darker blue represents a gap between the Continent, uh, edges of the continents and the red represents overlap. And you can see the amount of gap and overlap is not significant. So these continents actually would fit really tightly together if they would be placed that way. And so <clears throat> this is too good to say to be a coincidence. So that would le lead you to the conclusion that maybe the continents were once together. But that raises the question, if they were once together, how are they now apart? So that was a question that interested geologists for, and, and it eluded them for many years. There's additional ev evidence, sorry, that the continents once were together as one landmass, and that is that topographic and geologic features such as mountain ranges transcend continents. Say for example the Appalachian Mountains running along the east eastern coast of North America, they continue into Europe and Asia. The Caledonia Highlands of Scotland are the same mountain range as the Appalachian Mountains of North America. In addition there are fossils of terrestrial plants and marine reptiles that are found across the continents of South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia. Now the chances of these species of plants and animals independently evolving on all these different continents are pretty much non-existent. So the only logical explanation is that these organisms existed on this one large landmass that later separated. So if the continents were once together, then how did they move apart. How can continents move? Because we know that the seafloor has solid rock. It's composed of solid rock, so how can continents move through that solid rock? Well, some initial clues as to how the continents moved came from observations of the seafloor. So echo sounders, which is a way of measuring the depth of the ocean using uh, sound waves, uh, revealed that there was a large mountain range that ran down along the center of the Atlantic Ocean floor. Uh, and this was, uh, this, this discovery was one of the first uh, discoveries that would lead us to an answer. Secondly, the radiometric dating of rock of the sea floor showed us that the age of the sea floor is remarkably young along this ridge running through the center of the, of the Atlantic Ocean basin. And this was pretty, pretty surprising in contrast to the continents, because the continents are very old, you know, if not millions to billions of years old. So how could the continents be so old while the ocean floor is so young? Here's a map to show the age of the sea floor. The age is indicated by the color. You can see the red represents very young seafloor being formed uh, very recently, if not as we speak. And as we go from red to green to blue, we get progressively older with this dark blue being the oldest seafloor. And so we can see these features. This is the ridge in the middle of the Atlantic Basin that was discovered. The age of the seafloor is very young running along it. And these ridges are found other places in the ocean as well, and you can see how the seafloor is extremely young running along these ridges. 
And then if you move away from the ridge, the seafloor gets progressively older in both directions. And the age of the seafloor is symmetric on both sides of these ridges. So that was an, uh, so the age of the seafloor was a very, very interesting observation that was made. We did not have an explanation for it, but it was another clue on our way to understanding how the continents could move. So, <clears throat> if the continents were once together, then, as we mentioned, they would have to have drifted to their current locations. As you mentioned, this is obviously hard to reconcile because how can continents move forward through a solid rock? So, to come to an explanation, uh, geologists would have to have a better it's understanding. It's 30. Oh, sorry. A better understanding of the structure and dynamics of the interior of the planet. And so now we're going to uh, shift to take a look at Earth's interior, how it's organized, and the properties of it. So Earth has a layered structure inside, as we talked about in our first lecture. And when Earth was forming, it underwent a process known as density stratification, and through which the, the denser materials sank towards the bottom and the center, and the least dense materials rose to the top. And this produced the layered structure. And we know this because we're able to image Earth's interior using seismic waves. So seismic waves are vibrations that are generated by earthquakes that travel through Earth's interior, and we record them on the surface using instruments called seismometers. And so if the Earth was a homogeneous body, meaning it was uniform, made out of the same material with the same density, then these waves would travel in straight lines through the planet. This is not what we observe. If we, and we do know that the density of Earth should increase with depth, depth due to density stratification. In this case, figure B, the density increases gradually with depth. And if this was the case, the seismic waves, they would bend through a process known as refraction as they travel deeper and enter denser material in which they travel faster. This refraction bends the waves back up to the surface. We do observe this to uh, some extent, but we also observe a, an additional phenomenon uh, along with this refraction, and that is reflection. We observe the reflection of seismic waves off of the boundary between two layers of drastically different density. And so these are reflections off of the, different, the boundaries of the different layers of the Earth. And within layers, we see that refraction that suggests the density gradually increases within layers, and then there's drastic differences in densities at the boundaries between these different layers. So that's how we know what the internal structure of the planet is. The same way we're able to image inside our bodies using CAT scans and so forth, the seismologists are able to image the interior of the planet using seismic waves. And so, geologists, they define the layers of the Earth in two different ways. There's the chemical layers and the mechanical layers. The chemical layers are defined by what they are composed of, what their chemical composition is, and mechanical layers are defined by how they physically behave. Uh, the, those layers are listed here. We're going to go through each of them. We're going to start with the chemical layers, which you may have heard of before, most likely heard of before, which are the core, the mantle, and the crust. So these three chemical layers, uh, with the core being the innermost layer, and then followed by the mantle, and then the outermost layer being the crust. We're going to start on the outside and work our way in. So the first chemical layer we have is the crust. It's, it's the smallest layer, constituting 1% of Earth's volume. It's the outer, as I said, it's the outer layer of the Earth, outer chemical layer, and it's composed of solid rock. And there's two types of crust. There's thick continental crust and thin oceanic crust. Continental crust ranges between 20 to 90 kilometers thick, while the oceanic crust is significantly thinner, ranging between 5 and 10 kilometers. 
Capernaum crust is mostly made up of a rock called granite, which is less dense than the main constituent of oceanic crust, which is basalt. So what makes the crust chemically distinct is that it's a rock. And as we'll learn, it's different from the mantle beneath it because the crustal rocks are relatively poor in metal, metals such as iron and magnesium. And so in the mantle, as we just mentioned, it's also solid rock, just like the core, but what makes it different from the crust is that it's metal-rich rock. It has a large abundance of iron and magnesium, which also makes it very dense. And we're not surprised to hear that the mantle is denser than the crust because the mantle is beneath the crust. And I want to stress that the mantle is not molten rock. It is solid rock. Unfortunately, a lot of earth science textbooks have the mantle colored as red, which is the same color as magma or lava, which might give students the impression that it's molten, but it is in fact not molten, it is solid, and the mantle is the largest chemical layer of the planet, representing 83% of its volume. And then finally, the last chemical layer is the core. 16% Earth's volume, it uh, consists of a small inner region and a liquid outer portion. Both are composed of metals, pure metal. 95% iron and 5% nickel. And that's what makes it chemically distinct from the mantle and the crust, which are rock. The core is pure metal. And being pure metal, it's very dense, thus its position at the center of the planet. So those are the chemical layers. Next, we're going to look at the mechanical layers of the Earth. The mechanical layers of the Earth are defined by how they behave, or physically behave, or how they deform when stressed. So there's three different ways in which materials can deform. They can be elastic, in which a material deforms, and then whenever it's stressed, remember that stress is, re stress is relieved, the material returns to its original shape. Think a rubber band or a rubber ball. That's elastic deformation. Next there's brittle deformation. Brittle deformation occurs whenever an object is stressed. Stressed, it breaks or fractures. So unlike elastic deformation, which is temporary, brittle deformation is permanent. Once the material breaks or fractures, it's obviously permanently Finally, the third type of deformation is ductile deformation. This is also permanent deformation, like brittle duct deformation. But unlike brittle, the material does not fracture or break whenever it's stressed. It uh, deforms continuously. Uh, to give an example, think of clay or Play-Doh. You squeeze it, whenever you, if you squeeze it, you stress it, it deforms, but it's not breaking or fracturing, it just can continuously changes shape. Uh, but that deformation is permanent. And so these three layers, uh, sorry, these five layers of the mechanical, these five mechanical layers of the earth, pardon me, they exhibit these different types of deformation. Uh, starting from the outside and working our way in, we have the lithosphere, asthenosphere, mesosphere, outer core, inner core. And so the lithosphere is the outermost mechanical layer of the earth. Um, and lith is Greek for rock, so you think of the rock sphere, and it's the rock in this mechanical layer that behaves the way we think of rock to behave. And that is, it is pretty much, it's brittle. Uh, so when it's stressed, it can give a little bit elastically, change shape, and then return to its original shape, Though, it, but if you stress enough, it'll break and fracture. Okay. And the reason why the lithosphere is cold and brittle is, is brittle is because it's it's cold. It's the outermost layer. But if you go deeper in the planet, beneath the lithosphere, which I should say is composed of all of the crust and the uppermost part of the Earth's mantle, chemical layer of the mantle, if you go beneath the lithosphere, you have the mechanical layer known as the asthenosphere. As you can see in this figure, the asthenosphere is just below the lithosphere. And once again, lithosphere is composed of the crust, both continental and oceanic, and the uppermost part of the, of the mantle. And the asthenosphere is a thin layer just beneath the lithosphere. Asteno is weak in Greek, so this is the weak sphere. It is warm enough, because it's deeper in the planet, that it's no longer brittle. 
it actually undergoes ductile deformation like the clay we mentioned earlier. Although it takes very significant amounts of stress or pressure to deform it, those pressures do exist in the of the planet and it does deform like a fluid on very long time scales. And so it behaves plastically and can slowly quote unquote flow like a fluid. Now it's very slow. I mean the, the, the flow or the motion, rate of motion is roughly comparable to the rate at which your fingernails grow, which is on par of say centimeters per year. It's in this layer, the asthenosphere, that in isolated locations where the pressure and temperature conditions are right, that some molten rock can be generated uh, through what's known as partial melting, and that molten rock rises to the surface and results in volcanism. I want to stress, though, that since the asthenosphere, this, this mechanical layer, is part of the chemical layer known as the mantle, it is solid rock. It's just in isolated pockets that melting can occur, generated generating molten rock. Below the asthenosphere, we have what's known as the mesosphere. Meso for middle, it's Greek for middle. And it's a very large mechanical layer. It includes pretty much most of the mantle, so from the core mantle boundary up to the bottom of the asthenosphere. It's a very large mechanical layer. And it's very similar to the asthenosphere, where it's warm enough that it undergoes ductile deformation, and it can slowly flow on geologic timescales. The difference is because it's deeper, it's under more pressure, and it's a little bit stiffer than the asthenosphere. So if the asthenosphere is like a soft plastic, then the mesosphere is like a stiffer plastic. It just takes more stress to deform it. But like the asthenosphere, it can deform plastically and flow slowly on geologic timescales. And then we have the outer core. Now, it's actually a liquid. It's, and we said that the core is uh, made entirely of metal, so this liquid is molten metal. And it's actually convection and currents in the liquid outer core of the Earth, where you have charged um, iron ions flowing in these turbulent flow that generate Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's outer core is very important. And finally, we have the inner core, which is mechanically distinct from the outer core because it is solid, not liquid. And so, so those are the five mechanical layers of the Earth. In this figure, we have the chemical layers of the Earth on the, on the right, juxtaposed with the mechanical layers of the Earth on the left. So we have the core, the chemical layers of the core, which is strictly metallic. The mantle, which is very uh, dark, iron, uh, metal-rich, iron and magnesium-rich rock, very heavy to very dense. And then we have the crust, which is also rock, but it's relatively um, has relatively less metal and less iron and magnesium than the mantle rock does. It's less dense. So that's the chemical difference between the crust and the mantle is the amount of metals, I mean the iron and magnesium. Then we have the mechanical layers, the outer layer being a lithosphere, consists of the entirety of the crust and the uppermost portion of the, of the mantle. Then you have the asthenosphere, which is a thin layer just beneath the lithosphere. And it under goes ductile deformation. I forgot to mention, uh, repeat that the lithosphere it goes brittle deformation. And then under the uh, asthenosphere, we have the mesosphere, which undergoes ductile deformation like the asthenosphere, but it's a little bit stiffer. And we have the liquid outer core and the solid inner core. So now that we know the layers of the earth, now we're going to focus on how they interact with one another. So Buoyancy is this principle that states that an object, whenever it displaces a fluid, if it's submerged in a fluid, um, there will be an upward force on that object. And that upward force, which is called the buoyant force, is equal to the weight of the volume of the fluid that that object is displacing. So, for example, say you have a beach ball 
that is, let's say, one gallon in volume, just to give a nice even number out there, then if you would completely submerge it in water, it would displace one gallon of water. And so the upward force on that beach ball, the buoyant force, would be equal to the weight of the displaced volume of water, which is one gallon, so it would be equal to the weight of one gallon of water. Now, since the weight of one gallon of water is much more than the weight of the beach ball, the beach ball doesn't have to displace that much water, and so it rises to the top and it only displaces a little bit of water because it only has to displace a volume of water whose weight is equal to the object itself in order to bring it into equilibrium means that it's steady. And isostatic equilibrium is, is, is basically this concept where the lithosphere is floating in the asthenosphere. Remember, the lithosphere is the brittle, uh, rigid, mechan outer mechanical layer of the Earth, while the asthenosphere is the ductile, softer layer beneath the lithosphere. And the asthenosphere can flow on geologic time scales. So the lithosphere, in a sense, floats in the asthenosphere. And just like the water supports the beach ball, the asthenosphere su uh, supports the lithosphere. And thicker, more massive lithosphere, it's going to have to displace more asthenosphere to support its weight, to generate a larger buoyant force. And thinner, less massive lithosphere needs to displace less asthenosphere. Uh, it's because it doesn't need as large of a buoyant force because it's not as massive. So we can we can think of isostatic equilibrium in the context of a container ship. So an empty container ship, it floats high in the water because it only has to support uh, displace a small volume of water because that small volume of water that it displaces equals the weight of the volume of the, sorry the mass. And the weight of that displaced volume of water equals the weight of the boat. But if we add to the weight of the boat by loading it, the boat now has to sink lower in the water in order to displace a larger volume of, the wa of water. Because remember, it's the volume, it's the weight of the volume of the fluid displaced that's equal to the buoyant force. So to get a buoyant force large enough. upward, get a large enough point force in the upward direction to counteract the weight acting down, the ship needs to displace more water. That's why it sinks lower in the water. And the same thing is true with the continents. So if you have a large mountain, it's going to have to displace a large amount of asthenosphere. Because this asthenosphere is providing the buoyant force upward supporting this lithosphere. Okay, so the buoyant force up lithosphere is equal to the weight of the lithosphere acting down. Let's say if this mountain erodes over time, it'll be less massive, therefore its weight will decrease. And as its weight decreases, the buoyant force required to float it Will decrease, so we'll have to displace as much asthenosphere. So, what will happen is the lithosphere will actually begin to kind of uh, bob up, float up a little bit as more asthenosphere comes into uh, field of space as it floats higher. This can actually be observed in Scandinavia, but, or uh, our GPS measurements show that the land is increasing in elevation. That's because after the last ice age, where the glaciers were added mass to the lithosphere, causing it to sink lower in the asthenosphere. Once those glaciers melted, there was less mass in the asthenosphere, so it, it's beginning to it has been rising up, bobbing up, and the asthenosphere has been flowing in underneath it. It is less massive, so it needs to displace less asthenosphere in order to float. So the continents rise above the ocean because we have this very thick uh, continental crust that's made up of mostly granite, which is a little bit less dense than basalt. But 
but this very low, this relatively low density granite, it floats fairly high in the asthenosphere. And so it rises well above the very thin, a little bit denser oceanic atmosphere. So now that we know that the continents, which are part of the lithosphere, float in the asthenosphere like a boat floating in water, so we still don't know how they could move, right? So how could these continents move without, say, the seafloor piling up in front of them and a gap forming behind them as they move? Well, to understand how this is possible, we would look at how the temperature of Earth varies with depth. So here we see a graph with temperature increasing this way along the x-axis in degrees centigrade. Um, and their depth increasing downwards. And so this is the surface, zero, and this is the center of the Earth. You can see the temperature constantly increases with depth. So the interior of the planet is very hot. Now if we compare the difference in the temperatures at the top of the mantle to the bottom of the mantle, you can see there's a very significant difference in temperature, or dt. It's, a, it's around 1,000 degrees centigrade. It's maybe being a little more than 2,500 degrees C, and this a little more than 1,500 degrees C. It's a pretty substantial difference in temperature. Now remember, the mantle is the same chemical layer, so the material is made out of pretty, pretty much the same, same uh, material. It has the same density, it's made out of the same material, but it's at two very different temperatures between the top and the bottom. And temperature has an influence on the density of the material. And this is because of a phenomenon known as thermal expansion. It's that whenever you heat a material up, the molecular vibrations of the material become more energetic, and all of the molecules, though they're bonded together to form a solid, they're vibrating more vigorously, and they, each molecule takes up a little bit more space because of its more vigorous vibration as you heat it up. And each molecule taking up a little bit more space causes the material as a whole to slightly increase in volume. Now, if you don't change the mass and keep it constant, but you cause the volume to increase, it's supposed to be an arrow there. As a result, you're going to cause the density, which is the ratio of mass to the volume, to decrease. So if you warm a material up, it slightly expands, causing it to decrease slightly in density. And then the opposite happens when you cool material down. It slightly contracts, which causes it to become slightly denser. We can see this, uh, this phenomenon of thermal expansion whenever we say cross a large bridge. You'll see those joints going across the road, the surface road, the road surface, where they look like teeth, interlocking teeth. Those are known as expansion joints. Uh, they interlock more in the summer as the materials warm and expand, and during winter as the materials cool and retract, the teeth kind of disengage slightly. So that allows for the expansion and contraction of the materials, so it doesn't buckle or or uh, or uh, tighten under tension. In the winter. And so anyways, because of thermal expansion, the rock at the bottom of the mantle is much hotter, and so therefore it's less dense than the quarter rock at the top of the mantle. And having this less dense material above denser material, it's gravitationally unstable. And to reach the stability, the denser material begins to sink towards the bottom, while the less dense material begins to rise. Now you might ask yourself, well how does dense rock sink and less dense rock rise? It's this rock, it's not you know, able to move. Well remember that this is in the mesosphere and the asthenosphere, that this rock is warm enough that it can undergo ductile deformation and slowly flow on geological time scales. And so that's exactly what it does. It's very warm mantle rock. It's low, low, it has a 
it's relatively low density, it begins to rise. And let's call it an upwell. And as it rises near the surface, the material diverges, some flowing in one direction, some flowing in the other direction. And cooler, and as, it, as the rock cools, it contracts, becomes denser, and it eventually sinks. And this process is known as convection, where you have hot, warmer, uh, then as a result, lower density material rising, and cooler, higher density material sinking. And this convection is occurring uh, in an effort to transport heat from Earth's interior to space. It's Earth trying to cool. Okay, so now that we know that Earth's interior is actually not static, it's dynamic. It's churning. Though it's slowly, it's still churning nonetheless. And in 1960, the theory of seafloor spreading was proposed by Harry Hess and Robert Dietz. This was trying to explain the age of the seafloor in the context of these uh, convection cells, or convection currents, in Earth's mantle. And according to the theory of seafloor spreading, new seafloor develops at these mid-ocean ridges and then is pulled away from those ridges. And these ridges form above convective upwellings in the mantle. So for example, this is one of those ridges. As mantle material rises in this convective upwelling and it diverges, the seafloor is pulled apart in two different directions. And, and, and instead of a gap forming here, new seafloor is formed along that ridge. And that explains the very young age of the seafloor along the ridge and how the age of the seafloor increases with distance away from the ridge. So this, this seafloor spreading is a product of this convective upwelling in Earth's mantle. And due to this spreading, the continents are pushed aside by the spreading seafloor. And thus, this seafloor spreading acts as a mechanism for moving the continents. So convection in Earth's current, uh, convection in Earth's mantle is ultimately responsible for it. But above these convective upwellings in the, man in the mantle, you have formation of these ridges where new seafloor is formed and then pulled away from that point of origin. And as a result, the continents are moved with it. But if new seafloor is being formed at these mid ocean ridges, this new surface, uh, the surface area would be increasing. And if the surface area of Earth was increasing, then Earth would be expanding. But there's no evidence of the Earth getting larger. So as a result, some surface area must be being destroyed somewhere else to balance out the creation of new surface area at these mid ocean ridges. And researchers discovered that along the rim of the Pacific Ocean Basin, oceanic lithosphere sinks underneath uh, the surface and down back into the mantle. And the regions where this oceanic lithosphere sinks back down into the interior of the planet, these are known as subduction zones. And in 1965, the idea that the continents moved, along with seafloor spreading, in addition to the idea of subduction, they were all pulled together into one theory called plate tectonics. And according to the theory of plate tectonics, the lithosphere is broken up into individual pieces known as tectonic plates. These plates float on the asthenosphere and are driven by convection currents in Earth's mantle. So this is how uh, Whenever the continents move, there's not a pileup of rock in front of them because the seafloor actually sinks underneath of them as the continents move over top of them. Uh, and this is why a gap doesn't form behind them because new seafloor is being formed as they, in between them as they move away from one another. And the ultimate source of energy that's driving all this is heat in Earth's interior. And where does the heat come from? Well, some of that heat was left over from Earth's formation, the heat that uh, resulted in Earth being molten initially, allowing it to undergo density stratification. But a lot of that heat is gone, though some of it's still there, but most of the heat in Earth's interior is provided by radioactive decay, 
which would be an unstable element such as uranium, it melts mantle, they decay, and during the process of radioactive decay, heat is released. And that heat helps keep the Earth's interior warm, and it's the act of that heat trying to escape through conduction, heat trying through rock, and heat and convection, hot rock, uh, less, um, less dense hot rock rising, while less uh, denser rock sinking, conduction and convection together, they're trying to cool the earth. And so that heat powers pipe tectonics and uh, the things that are byproducts of pipe tectonics as well, which like for example earthquakes, volcanoes, and the construction of mountains. So radioactive decay is pretty much the, the primary source of energy for driving plate tectonics on Earth. So here is an illustration of the tectonic cycle or system on the planet where you have a convective upwelling of Earth's mantle. Above that convective upwelling, you have a formation of the ocean ridge where a new seafloor forms and is then pulled away from the ridge by the convection currents in Earth's mantle. Okay. And then you have um, convective downwellings where colder material sinks, it sinks. And those usually form where two plates collide and ocean atmosphere sinks underneath an overriding plate and what's known as subduction. So it's a tectonic cycle. So, as we mentioned, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes are the result of plate tectonics. And most earthquakes and volcanoes, not all, but most, occur uh, along plate boundaries. And they occur as the result of those plates interacting with one another along their boundaries. And if we map the locations of earthquakes and volcanoes, we see that we can find these boundaries between the plates. So you can see where all these volcanoes and earthquakes map to. As I mentioned, not all uh, volcanoes and not all earthquakes happen along plate boundaries, but most happen along plate boundaries. And by making maps like this, we can uh, plot the boundaries of the various plates on Earth. So these are the different tectonic plates. Now remember, tectonic plates are pieces or fragments of the Earth's lithosphere. Some plates are very large, like the North American plate, the Pacific plate. Uh, other plates are medium sized, like the Nazca plate, to very small plates, like the Honda Fuca plate. Now, these are just the current plates on Earth. Uh, the plates change over time. So, for example, the Honda Fuca plate used to be much bigger. It was called the Fairlawn plate. But most of it has subducted or sank under North America into the mantle, and only this little tip of it remains. And it's known as the Honda Fuca. So the uh, shape and configuration of the tectonic plates changes geologic time. So tectonic plates can interact with one another in three different ways, uh, resulting in three different types of tectonic plate boundaries. One way in which they interact with each other is when they move away from one each other, move away from each other. And this forms what's known as a divergent plate boundary. And this is what a mid-ocean ridge is, where new seafloor is formed, and then it's the, the sphere moves away from the ridge. Next is the transform plate boundary, and this occurs whenever the plates move alongside one another. Uh, and finally, we have the convergent plate boundary, which uh, forms where plates move toward one another. And subduction, which we mentioned, where two plates converge and one plate sinks down to the mantle, that subduction is a type of convergent plate boundary. So first we'll start with divergent plate boundaries. So as I mentioned, divergent plate boundaries form above convective upwellings in, Earth man in Earth's mantle. So this hot mantle material rises and it diverges pulling the lithosphere above it in, in opposing directions. And along this ridge, new seafloor is being formed. And so these divergent plate boundaries on the seafloor, they're known as mid-ocean ridges or spreading centers. 
Now, they're known as mid-ocean ridges because the first one to be discovered was the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which happened to be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. But not all divergent plate boundaries or ocean ridges are in the middle of the, their respective ocean basins. But we still call them mid-ocean ridges because the first one discovered was the, happened to be in the middle of the ocean basin. So, but how does new lithosphere form along this ridge okay, to fill the gap as the lithosphere diverges from this boundary? And to answer that question, I have to look at how the temperature and pressure of the rock in the mantle changes as it rises. As this hot mantle rock rises from the deep parts of the mantle and diverges near the top, pulling the lithosphere apart, it's very warm because it's from, coming from the deep parts of the mantle. And it's, when it's down, down those deep parts of the mantle, it's also under a lot of pressure. So it's very high pressure and high temperature. But as it rises towards the surface, the pressure the rock is under decreases. Just like as you uh, swim up from the bottom of the swimming pool, pressure decreases, or as an airplane, as you climb altitude, pressure decreases. And because the pressure decreases without a significant decrease in temperature, the rock which was stable at high temperatures at, at these larger depths due to the high pressure becomes less stable as a solid at these still high temperatures but lower pressures. And so the rock, as it nears the surface, it begins to partially melt, not because the rock is heated up, but because the rock is decompressed. And so you can imagine what's happening on a molecular level when that rock's deep in the mantle, it's very, very warm. So the molecules of the rock are very energetic and they're vibrating. They're all bonded together because that's what makes a solid a solid. In fact, the molecules are all bonded together. But they don't have a lot of room to vibrate because they're under so much pressure. But they're so hot, the material's so hot that they're very energetic. But they stay together because of the immense pressure. But as the rock rises towards the surface, and the rock decompresses. These three very warm and energetic molecules, they have more and more space to vibrate until eventually the pressure decreases enough that they have enough space that they can vibrate vigorously enough that the bonds between them break. And over the bonds between molecules and the solid break, they can move freely from one another and that's what we call melting. And so that decompression of this very hot rising mantle rock and convective upwelling, a decompression of causes some of the rock to melt in what we call partial melting. And this partial melting is, is, a is the result of decompression of the rock as it rises towards the surface and convective upwelling. And uh, this process is known as decompression melting. And the molten rock produced by this decompression melting, it's now liquid and less dense than the solid rock around it. So it rises and emplaces itself in and um, just beneath the surface or erupts to the surface and it cools to form new rock, new oceanic lithosphere. So that's how new oceanic lithosphere is formed, these mid-ocean ridges. And then it will eventually be pulled away from the ridge at which it was created. So that's how the age of the seafloor is so young on this ridge because it's literally forming from the solidification We see uh, evidence of this, additional evidence of this, if we drill uh, through the seafloor and core the sediments, we can see that the thickness of the sediments increases with distance away from the ridge, and that the sediment composition uh, is, uh, the thickness and composition is symmetric about the ridge. And here we see the, the map we looked at before, where these lines right now, right here, we now know are divergent plate boundaries at which the plates are moving away from each other. So new seafloor is being formed along them and they are spreading away. So these are all, line red on red here, it's hard to see. These are moving away from each other all along these ridges. And these are above convective upwellings in Earth's mantle. That's uh, resulting in decompression melting forming new oceanic lithosphere along the ridge, and those convection currents rising and diverging in two different directions are pulling the lithosphere apart.
Here you see a little um, illustration where this is a ridge. So decompression melting produces melt that rises and cools. In place forms new lithosphere. The lithosphere then spreads away in opposing directions, forming a mid-ocean ridge. Additional evidence of this is in the magnetic polarization of minerals found in the uh, seafloor bedrock. So as this molten rock is cooling along the mid-ocean ridge, <clears throat> magnetic minerals in that cooling rock, they align themselves with the Earth's geomagnetic field. And, and so uh, currently, Earth's geomagnetic field is set up that this figure is actually wrong. The magnetic south pole is at the geographic north pole, and the magnetic north pole is at the geographic south pole. That's why the north pole of your compass points to geographic north, because it's attracted to the magnetic south uh, pole of the Earth's uh, di uh, magnetic dipole. And so the new seafloor forming along the ridge will take on the, uh, the magnetic polarity of the Earth's geomagnetic field at the time of its formation. However, the Earth's geomagnetic field changes in orientation throughout time. It is flipped back and forth, where uh, now the magnetic south pole is up here, and magnetic north pole is up there, but they flip-flop over time. And we can see that flip-flop in the magnetic polarization of the rock of the sea floor. See the Mid-Atlantic Ridge running through here. You can see uh, where we have reverse magnetic polarity. That means that the rock has the uh, the magnetic minerals of the rock have the opposite orientation of the current mag Earth's current magnetic field, and this beige is the normal magne magnetic polarity. So obviously, normal, which is present day, is forming right now. But in the past, say three million years ago, the magnetic polarity was switched, so we'd reversed polarity being stored in the rock. And so we have these alternating bands of normal and reversed uh, polarity of the magnetic minerals in the rock of the sea floor. We call this the magnetic barcode of the sea floor, and it also acts as evidence of uh, the formation of new oceanic lithosphere at the ridge and then the spreading of that lithosphere away from the ridge. In the study of the, of the uh, magnetic polarity of both oceanic and continental crust is called paleomagnetism. And paleomagnetism is an extremely interesting field and it can actually reconstruct the configurations of the continents throughout the Earth's past using paleomagnetism. So our diversion plate boundaries found on land, because most of the ones we have seen so far are these mid-ocean ridges on the sea floor. The answer is yes. And whenever our diversion plate boundary uh, they form above a convective upwelling or its mantle. Whenever that occurs beneath a continent, a diversion play boundary causes the continent to pull apart in a process known as continental rifting. So here we can see this is the continental lithosphere, which includes the crust in the uppermost part. That's an L for lithosphere, the crust in the uppermost part of the mantle. And a convective upwelling initiated beneath it, pulling the continental lithosphere in two different directions. Now, this causes a lithosphere to stretch, just like if you were stretching silly putty between your fingers, it begins to thin. And as a result, the lithosphere begins to crack and fracture because it's brittle, forming these faults. And in this convective upwelling, you have a decompression of very hot rock as it rises, which results in partial melting through decompression melting, and that melt rises to the surface and results in volcanism. And as the divergence continues and the rifting continues, the lithosphere further thins, forming what's known as a rift valley. And so uh, eventually, so we have rift valley, we have usually rivers or lakes in this rift valley, and we have volcanism, and eventually the spreading uh, continues to the point where the, the continental lithosphere completely thins out and the asthenosphere reaches just beneath the surface at which point new oceanic lithosphere begins to form and by this time this rift valley is large enough and deep enough that it has usually flooded resulting in a linear sea 
and then as the divergence continues, new seafloor is made at the plate, divergent plate boundary and spreads away, forming a, a large ocean basin. So yes, divergent plate boundaries do form on land, but most divergent plate boundaries are found along the seafloor, as we can see here. And the reason is, is because divergent plate boundaries create new ocean basins. They rip continents apart and form new ocean basins. So if one does exist in land, land is temporary. It'll eventually turn into a mid-ocean ridge. And here is an animation of this process. Okay, so here we have the continental crust in the uppermost part of the mantle, this darker colored material. Together they make the lithosphere. This thin line of orange beneath it is the asthenosphere. A convective upwelling is going to initiate, causing the lithosphere to be pulled apart in two different directions. Oh, I hit command print by accident. Cancel. Okay. And we can see the lithosphere is being thin, and the, and the asthenosphere is coming closer to the surface. We have faulting in the lithosphere and the creation of a rift valley. Decompression melting in the rising asthenosphere results in formation of melt, which rises to the surface and results in volcanism. And eventually, the lithosphere completely thins, the asthenosphere reaching just beneath the surface and forming new oceanic lithosphere. By this time, this is usually flooded. So where we had one uh, tectonic plate that was a continental lithosphere, we had the formation of the divergent plate boundary uh, and the breakup of that plate now into two separate plates that are moving away from each other, driven by the convective upwelling in the mantle beneath it. So this currently is happening today in Eastern Africa. It's known as the East African Rift Valley. So the East African Rift Valley is here highlighted in red. So you see it's this low-lying area where there's rivers and lakes in it. There's also volcanism in this rift valley due to the decompression melting occurring in the convective upwelling beneath it. Uh, and that, that volcanism, you might have heard of some of these volcanoes like Mount Kilimanjaro, for example. But so this rift valley is forming, and uh, eventually it will flood, and it will be similar to what the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden are today, because these were rift valleys. They formed whenever divergence, divergence initiated and broke the Arabian plate from the African plate. So this used to be one plate, but divergence initiated continental rifting, rifted the Arabian plate from Africa, and these rift valleys flooded, forming these linear seas. I believe that it was uh, the, the uh, rift valley of East Africa, the East African Rift Valley, that uh, had those steep slopes in the Lion King, in which Mufasa was trampled in. Uh, if that helps paint a picture for you. I believe that was Disney's depiction of the uh, East African Rift Valley. And also in the part of the Lion King with Scar and the hyenas were singing the song, Be Prepared, there's that volcanism in the background, and I think that's an allusion to the volcanism of the East African Rift Valley as well. So North America and Africa used to be together, one continent, one large continent, that's Pangea, but about 210 to 200 million years ago, uh, the continent, continental rifting uh, occurred because of convective upwelling initiated beneath the continent. That rifting formed the Rift Valley, which then eventually uh, continued, and North America split from Africa, and that Rift Valley flooded to form a long linear sea, which was the beginning of the Atlantic Ocean. And that divergent plate boundary that rifted North America from Africa apart 
broke up Pangea is the mid-ocean ridge of today. So you can see this large of the landmass known as Pangea and divergence initiated and began to uh, rift. It rifted North America from Africa, forming the beginning of the Atlantic Ocean. And later, uh, South America would rift from Africa and Africa from Antarctica, India, and Australia. And eventually the continents would move into their present day locations. And so the breakup of Pangea was the result of divergent plate boundaries, continental rifting, and those continental rifts turning into mid-ocean ridges. So, uh, the next type of plate boundary we're going to discuss are transform plate boundaries. And transform plate boundaries are plate boundaries along which plates move alongside one another. Unlike diversion plate boundaries, they're not a direct result of mantle convection. So, uh, transform plate boundaries are more the uh, result of these straight segments that are diversion plate boundaries existing in a curved plate boundary. So, diversion plate boundaries come in these straight segments. But together, they, they form this curved boundary. So in order to be curved, these straight segments have to be offset by these perpendicular, small perpendicular segments. And these perpendicular segments to the uh, diversion plate boundaries are the transform plate boundaries. You can see as okay, the spreading occurs here, and this plate moves that way, and this plate moves this way. And then as the spreading occurs here, this plate moves that way, and this plate moves this way. If you were standing on this plate, you would see this plate moving in this direction. If you're standing on this plate, you would see that plate moving in that direction. So they're moving alongside one another in what is known as a transform plate boundary. And you can see all the orange segments that are divergent, segments are divergent plate boundaries. They're offset by these blue segments, which are transform plate boundaries. So most transform plate boundaries are these little tiny connecting segments between adjacent uh, segments of divergent plate boundaries. However, some of them are large, and the large ones tend to uh, exhibit large earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes do occur at divergent plate boundaries too, though the, the earthquakes at divergent plate boundaries tend to be small. So, uh, some of the large, the few large transform plate boundaries you might have heard of, like the San Andreas Fault, California, Alpine Fault, New Zealand, or North Anatolian Fault running through northern Turkey. Uh, so the plates are moving alongside one another. Okay? And so there can be sometimes large earthquakes between them. But one thing that does not occur along transform plate boundary is volcanism. There's no volcanism in transform plate boundaries. You see in this case, the San Andreas Fault is connecting this divergent plate boundary to this one. And then there's other transform plate boundaries too like this one, and that one, and these little ones. So San Andreas Fault happens to be just a very large one. 